Hello, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Newell. I'm the director of the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center, professor of pediatrics, pharmacology, and special education at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'd like to welcome everyone to this presentation entitled Encouraging News in Rett Syndrome, Steps Towards Timely, Accurate Diagnosis and Treatment Breakthroughs. Rett Syndrome is a rare neurodevelopmental condition that markedly impairs the quality of life of affected individuals. While there are therapeutic approaches to Rett syndrome, all of these are directed towards symptom management, and no Rett syndrome-specific or disease-modifying therapies currently exist. This scenario may soon improve as clinical trials of potential Rett therapies are showing encouraging results. Within this activity, we'll review the diagnosis and management strategies for Rett syndrome. We'll discuss some of the underlying pathophysiological features and then review recent therapy developments that are ongoing and could ultimately improve the care and outcomes for people with Rett syndrome and their families. So first, let's talk about what is Rett syndrome. So Rett syndrome is a severe neurodevelopmental disorder, and it primarily affects girls and women, and ultimately is the second most common cause of intellectual disability in girls and women. It's estimated to occur in about one in 10,000 to 15,000 live female births. And there are a number of clinical features that are present in people who have Rett syndrome that can markedly impair their ability to have a good quality of life. Most of the people with Rett syndrome have loss of function mutations in an X-linked gene called MECP2 or methyl CPG binding protein 2. And these mutations are generally de novo or spontaneous rather than inherited from a carrier. There are hundreds of different mutations in this gene that cause Rett syndrome, but there are eight common recurrent mutations that account for over 65% of all disease. The disease is typically seen in people after a normal pregnancy and uncomplicated delivery. Following, they have a apparently normal neurologic and physical development until subtle signs might start emerging. And then approximately between six and 18 months of life, they may start not meeting developmental milestones. But importantly, about 18 to 30 months, typically, people who with Rett syndrome undergo a psychomotor regression. And specifically, they lose the ability to speak and they lose acquired purposeful hand skills. They develop a characteristic repetitive hand stereotypy, these movements, and they have impairment in their ability to walk or they may not be able to walk at all. There's a normal arc of this disease, as I mentioned, with a relatively normal development followed by the stagnation and then this regression, but then a stabilization, which is called stage three. So the first stage is a stagnation, the second stage is a regression, and then stage three is a stabilization where the regression no longer occurs and they stabilize in the skills they have. And they may have some slight improvements in some of their skills. But oftentimes in this stage three is when a lot of the other clinical features that I'm going to talk about in a second start to emerge. We also know that later, something called stage four, which is a late motor decline or deterioration occurs. And this is oftentimes in the teen years or young adulthood, where you might see development of other motor function problems, especially rigidity and stiffness and things that might be similar to Parkinson's disease impairing the ability to walk or stand. And you might see more development of scoliosis or wheelchair use in that time. So these are, represent some of the key diagnostic criteria of Rett syndrome, which is this normal disease pattern, which a relatively normal initial development followed by some stagnation with regression, but stabilization. And that regression is not relentless as might be seen in a neurodegenerative condition. So people with Rett syndrome have that normal disease pattern. They have the loss of acquired hand skills, loss of spoken language and gait problems and the repetitive hand movements. So that's the criteria for classic or typical Rett. There is an atypical form of Rett syndrome, which meets at least two of those four major criteria I just talked about, plus the presence of supportive criteria, such as teeth grinding or impaired sleep. People with Rett syndrome have a normal head size at birth, 
but we've observed that growth of the head decelerates over time, with some people becoming, frankly, microcephalic, but not all of them, and is not required to be microcephalic to have Rett syndrome. With careful measurements, this growth deceleration can be observed as early as two to three months of life. Rett syndrome is a progressive neurodevelopmental disorder. It is not considered a neurodegenerative disorder. And the reason is that evidence from histological studies from people who had Rett syndrome does not support any death of neurons or brain tissue. Furthermore, as opposed to seen in truly childhood neurodegenerative conditions, the loss of skills and the regression is not continuous, but it stabilizes at a point. So we do not consider this to be a neurodegenerative condition. Besides these major clinical features that I mentioned with problems with hand skills, and language, and walking, there are a number of other clinical features that are very common in Rett syndrome. A number of neurological problems with motor tone problems and other problems with movements, but importantly, seizures are a major problem in people with Rett syndrome. Additionally, people with Rett syndrome have a number of gastrointestinal problems. They have trouble chewing and swallowing. They have trouble with gastroesophageal reflux. They have slow GI transit time and really pretty severe constipation that is a major concern for caregivers. And they also can have daytime teeth grinding. All of these problems with the GI, especially the chewing and swallowing, oftentimes leads to growth failure in people with Rett syndrome. Although some people with Rett syndrome may actually be normal size or even obese. With the motor problems are things like scoliosis and fixed contractures. Sleep problems are very common in Rett syndrome, as are other physiological or autonomic problems with particular breathing irregularities, with hyperventilation, breath holding, and autonomic dysfunction such as cold, blue hands or feet. Sometimes they may be hot or red. And then cardiac dysrhythmias and a propensity to prolongation of the QT interval on the electrocardiogram. We have learned quite a bit about Rett syndrome through a natural history study in Rett syndrome that was supported by the National Institutes of Health, which ran from 2003 to 2021. And it really provided key information on the disease course and clinical features of this disorder. Additionally, recent work has been conducted using a large claims database in people with Rett syndrome, with nearly 6,000 people with Rett syndrome. And that found what we've known, we'd expect that neurological disorders are a major issue, especially epilepsy. Additionally, the GI and nutritional disorders are clearly present in this claims database, primarily in younger individuals, but we know this persists throughout life. And then orthopedic problems, which like scoliosis and having to have surgery, which is typically seen more in the teens into adulthood. And from that claims day, we also learned that there are commonly used management strategies such as anti-seizure drugs and feeding assistance, plus the use of physical speech, language, and occupational therapies, primarily for the therapies in younger individuals. Now, there is an issue with the diagnosis and the delays in diagnosis that might occur in Rett syndrome. Through the natural history study that I mentioned, it was found that the median age of diagnosis was 2.7 years for typical Rett syndrome. But the diagnosis is becoming earlier from more increased awareness and also more increased use of genetic testing. Typically, diagnoses have been made by neurologists, developmental pediatricians, or geneticists, less often by pediatricians or other primary care providers. It's important that physicians maintain a high index of suspicion for signs of early subtle delay, and especially for regression in children, and especially in girls, since we know they're the primary the people who are affected. In the deceleration of head growth, not necessarily being frankly megacephalic, could be an early clue of something being wrong in the context of a girl who's showing developmental delay. One of the problems uh, making this initial diagnosis is there are other clinical features that may appear similar to Rett syndrome, and the initial diagnosis may be these other disorders, such as autism, Angelman syndrome, general cerebral palsy, or neurodegenerative conditions of childhood. Additionally, because the early features are kind of nonspecific developmental delay, that might just be the diagnosis for people who ultimately go on to have Rett syndrome before they have their regression. 
This clinical overlap with these other disorders and the presence of these other nonspecific features, such as tone abnormalities or behavioral problems or reflux, may confound or delay the diagnosis. In addition to people with Rett syndrome, which I mentioned are primarily girls, there are boys who have MECP2 mutations. A lot of these boys are very severely affected from birth without a normal period of development. But we're increasingly recognizing MECP2 mutations in boys who are not so severely affected from birth, but have other related problems. They may have an isolated intellectual disability. They may be diagnosed with autism or other behavioral problems. And they may later on show more manifestations that we see in girls with Rett syndrome. So it's important to consider that even in boys. In addition to the loss of function mutations causing Rett syndrome, there is also a neurodevelopmental disorder in which there is too much MECP2, and that's called the MECP2 duplication syndrome, where the entire genetic locus of MECP2 has been duplicated. This primarily affects boys, and it also is a severe neurodevelopmental disorder. These boys have a variety of problems, and they have problems with spoken language. They have very severe seizures, and they have intellectual disabilities and some behavioral problems. So one of the issues is that we know that the diagnosis of Rett syndrome is not always occurring in a timely fashion. And this is important because being able to make this diagnosis provides an opportunity to counsel the family about what the overall prognosis of the disorder and to be able to recognize and look for potential comorbidities. Furthermore, we think that early initiation of therapies can be beneficial. So physical and occupational and behavioral therapies could be beneficial, especially early. Additionally, the early and aggressive treatment of associated problems, especially the nutritional and gastrointestinal problems, could help prevent the malnutrition and growth failure that's seen in many people with Rett syndrome. Furthermore, the effect of the MECP2 mutation probably has the greatest impact on overall brain function and synaptic development before the age of two. And as we start developing more targeted treatments, the ability to identify people early in life to intervene may be increasingly important. So let's talk a little bit about the underlying genetic molecular issues that go on in Rett syndrome and what the cause is. So that, as I mentioned previously, the vast majority of people with Rett syndrome have mutations in the gene methyl CPG binding protein 2 or MECP2. There are some people who have features of Rett syndrome that may have mutations in other genes, such as CDKL5 or FOXG1. Both of these disorders, while having clinical features similar to Rett syndrome, are now recognized as distinct disorders. The MECP2 gene encodes a protein that binds to DNA and recognizes epigenetic marks to regulate the expression of other genes. MECP2 is most highly expressed in neurons, although it is expressed broadly throughout the body. MECP2 controls the expression of a large number of genes. And important for the neuronal function, it controls the expression of a variety of neurotransmitters, neurotransmitter receptors, and other neuromodulators and other neuronal proteins. The loss of MECP2 disrupts overall neuronal function and alters the ability for synapses to work well. There have been animal models that have been developed in which MECP2 has been disrupted, and these animals show very similar neurologic, behavioral, and physiological features as those seen in people with Rett syndrome. Functional MECP2 depletion is hypothesized to be a major contributor to the CNS manifestations in Rett syndrome. MECP2 mutations lead to the dysregulation of several molecular processes and mechanisms, including brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, microRNA, and glutamatergic pathways, leading to impaired neuron growth. BDNF is a signaling protein and member of the neurotrophin family of growth factors that influences survival, development, and improved function of neurons. BDNF stimulates the differentiation of progenitor cells to form neurons, supports the survival of existing neurons, and encourages growth and strengthening of new neurons through axonal and dendritic sprouting, leading to increased connections with other neurons. It also strengthens the synapse through increasing numbers of receptors, resulting in improved cognitive function. 
The lack of BDNF results in the weakening of synaptic strength, making neurons more vulnerable to stressors and atrophy. It leads to a disruption of signaling, decreasing synaptic connections required for efficiency in memory and learning. MicroRNAs are involved in glial and neural cell type determination, migration of newly formed neurons, neuronal cell type determination, neuronal polarization, axonal formation, and dendrite branching. Interruption of microRNA pathways in the CNS may result in gross abnormalities, for example, ataxia and gait abnormalities associated with cerebellar impact. The exact interplay of molecular interactions is complex and remains unclear. MECP2 deficiency disrupts processes involving glutamatergic synaptic responses and astrocyte, glial cell, microglia, and oligodendrocyte functions. Dysfunctional glutamate signaling can result in neurotoxicity and negatively alter brain function. So now I'd like to switch gears a bit and talk about the development of guideline-based management and then ultimately talk about what kind of exciting new prospects there are in emerging therapies. There obviously has been a need to develop consensus guidelines for the management because the overall problems in Rett syndrome are multi-system and they require the interaction between primary care providers and other health professionals to manage these complex medical morbidities and to consider it within the context of the entire aspect of the individual and their relationship to their families. Given that we know that the median life expectancy for Red syndrome is over 50 years old, it's important that health professionals have clear guidance to be able to develop the best possible outcomes for these special need individuals. With that in mind, Work was recently conducted to develop consensus guidelines for the management of Rett syndrome. This began with literature review of publications on Rett syndrome to identify symptoms and the most important care concerns. This was developed through discussion and review amongst clinical experts at ex Rett syndrome centers of excellence and with people who had been involved in the natural history study, and importantly, with input from patient advocacy groups such as the Rett Syndrome Research Trust or the International Rett Syndrome Foundation. These guidelines then developed age-dependent health supervision recommendations, and they were split into different ages because it's recognized that the features of Rett Syndrome emerge in different age groups, and they are more problematic in different age groups. So this guideline provided recommended assessments, surveillance, and planning needs appropriate to the patient's Asian overall disease status, and also which other specialists should be considered at different ages for consultation or referral. Some of the features that were recommended in the guidelines are doing genetic testing to look for MECB2 mutations, monitoring their medications, their height and their weight, their head circumference, their sexual development, importantly thinking about their nutritional status, their growth, and their gastrointestinal problems, all the neurological issues related to seizures, importantly some things like cardiac evaluations, use it with regular ECGs to look for QTC prolongation, and monitoring the development of orthopedic issues such as scoliosis and considering referring to orthopedics for evaluation. Beyond the medical issues are recommendations to address other issues that are important, such as the psychosocial, environmental, and educational issues that arise in people with Rett syndrome. Importantly, this disorder has a very large impact on the family, affecting the emotional, physical, and financial well-being of the family. So it's important to consider the approach to Rett syndrome for the person and the entire family. Within the context of treating people with Rett syndrome, there's a consideration of what are the current treatments, and they are entirely now symptom-directed. There are no FDA-approved Rett syndrome-specific therapies, and there are no disease-modifying therapies that have been approved. We know from animal work that re-expression of MECP2 in animals lacking it, even after they started developing symptoms, can reverse this disorder. This provides great promise that they may be able to develop therapies that can significantly modify the disease course or even reverse it. There is some issue that putting back MECP2 
might have a narrow therapeutic window because we know from the MECP2 duplication syndrome that too much MECP2 is also problematic. But with an enhanced understanding of MECP2 function and the development of new ideas, there provides a great opportunity for new treatments to be developed. And excitingly, clinical trials have been done and are underway in Rett syndrome that really might provide these new therapeutic options. And these options may really meaningfully improve the lives of people with Rett syndrome and their families. So let me talk to you about some of the ongoing and completed trials. The first new therapy that's in current development that I'd like to talk about is a compound called trifinitide. Trifinitide is a synthetic analog of a tripeptide that's derived from the amino terminus of insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1. This tripeptide specifically is glycine proline glutamate, or glypromate. Trifinitide is a synthetic analog of glypromate with additional features added that improve the drug qualities and make it orally active and being able to be dosed twice a day. Glypromate is believed to normalize neuronal and glial function and has been shown to have neuroprotective and anti-seizure properties. Previous work in animal models of Rett syndrome, treating them with glypromate, improved symptoms. Glypromate and trofinitide both have evidence of reducing in neuroinflammation, normalizing synaptic activity and dendritic morphology, and improving neuronal signaling. Trofinitide has previously been evaluated in two phase two trials in Rett syndrome, one in adults and one in children. Both of these studies showed that trofinitide was safe in Rett syndrome and well tolerated. Furthermore, both studies showed signals of efficacy using both clinician and caregiver rating scales and in adults and in children. This evidence led to a phase three trial of trofinitide in Rett syndrome that has recently been completed. This trial involved people with Rett syndrome who were five to 20 years old, and they were exposed to either trofinitide or placebo in a randomized, blinded, controlled fashion over 12 weeks time. The co-primary endpoints included a caregiver scale called the Rett Syndrome Behavior Questionnaire, or the RSBQ, which covers a variety of important domains in Rett Syndrome, and a clinician-rated scale called the Clinician Global Impression of Improvement, which has Rett Syndrome-specific anchors that include domains that are very important, such as communication, ambulation, hand use, seizures, etc. It also involved a key secondary endpoint, which measured nonverbal communication. After 12 weeks of treatment, trofinitide was shown to improve both of the co-primary endpoints compared to placebo. Additionally, trofinitide improved the key secondary communication endpoint. The most common adverse event reported was diarrhea, with about 80% of people on trofinitide having diarrhea compared to about 19% of people on placebo. The vast majority of people who had diarrhea in this trial were ranked to be mild or moderately severe. The evaluation of trifinitide is also ongoing with open-label studies. There is an open-label continuation study for the people who were in the phase three trial, which is ongoing and scheduled to be completed later this year, and then a further extension open-label study that is spanning into 2023. Additionally, Trofinitide is being evaluated in a phase two, three study in very young children, two to five years old, to look at the pharmacokinetics, the safety, tolerability, and any signals of efficacy. Another compound that is being evaluated in Red syndrome is called Anavex 273. Anavex 273 is a sigma-1 receptor agonist and a muscarinic receptor modulator. Previous work in mice showed that this compound could improve cellular homeostasis and synaptic plasticity and increase the release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, an important neurotrophic factor in Rett syndrome. Furthermore, it improved a variety of symptoms seen in these mice. Recently, top-line results from a phase three trial in adult women with Rett syndrome showed a significant improvement compared to placebo for their primary efficacy endpoint which was response in the Rett syndrome behavior questionnaire, the caregiver rated scale I mentioned previously. There is an ongoing phase two, three trial in 
children between five and 17 years old with Rett syndrome to look for safety, tolerability, and efficacy using endpoints involving multiple clinical and exploratory molecular and biochemical measures. This is estimated to be completed later this year. In addition to Anovex 273 and trifinitide, other trials have been conducted in Rett syndrome, including cannabidiol, which was halted due to difficulties in enrollment during the pandemic, the use of NMDA receptor antagonists, such as dextromethorphan, which showed promising features in a small-scale trial, and ketamine, another NMDA receptor antagonist, which recently completed a phase two trial, and we're awaiting the results from that. Finally, moving forward, there are gene therapy trials initiating in Rett syndrome, as well as the development of other genetically-based therapies. In consideration of this therapy development, it's quite an exciting time. Both trifinitide and Anovex 273 have been designated by the FDA to have a fast-track designation in a rare pediatric disease and an orphan drug designation. These could be very important features in the accelerated approval of compounds such as this by the FDA for use. And the development of new approaches, as mentioned, with genetically targeted therapies provide great opportunity for the future. So in summary, I hope I've provided an overview of what Rett syndrome is, a rare and very debilitating neurodevelopmental condition that primarily affects girls and is usually caused by mutations in MECP2. There are guidelines on the clinical management for Rett syndrome to help primary care providers and specialists improve how they approach the clinical care and management of people with Rett syndrome from early years to adulthood. The current management strategies are based on treating underlying symptoms, such as seizures, but the development of Rett syndrome-specific therapies has the opportunity to improve how we really take care of people with Rett syndrome. It's very encouraging top-level results from the recently reported phase three trials. So this concludes the educational activity. I hope you found it informative and very useful to your practice, and thank you very much for participating. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the practice aids.